Uh, welcome everybody to today's story share event. We are just so glad uh, that you could join us today to hear three dynamic young African women leaders use personal narrative to take us right into the heart of the issues that they're most passionate about. We have been looking forward to this event for some weeks now, and it's really the culmination of a multi-part event that we offered exclusively for uh, you, our 150 alumni of the Mandela Washington Fellowship here at the Presidential Precinct. Um, we're always looking for ways of, that we can continue to add value to the leadership journey of our alumni. And the art of storytelling, as you all know, is a topic um, that's of keen interest to all of us. It's really our shared interest. And in one way or another, we have focused on this topic each summer during our uh, Leadership and Civic Engagement Institute. But we thought it would be a lot of fun this spring to return to the topic here in a virtual format and to offer some new perspectives on uh, the art of storytelling and also a professional development opportunity um, focused on how to craft a good story. So we have structured this event loosely around the theme of a spark. Uh, and we've left it up to our storytellers to interpret spark in any way that they want to. It could be a spark of an idea. It could be a sudden connection. It could be a spark between two people or something that started as just an ember and a glow that sparked and caught fire. Uh, it's really up to uh, those of you who are listening to the stories today um, to do your own interpretation and to see the spark in these stories. I wanted to offer my thanks and admiration, um, all of our thanks and admiration to our three storytellers who were brave enough uh, to step up, to experiment with this medium, and to be open and vulnerable um, with us and with all of you. And please know that we were cheering you on today. Um, so before I turn the mic over uh, to our, uh, our storytellers, I would like to, um, to give the floor to our good friend, Ruth Walkup, who has served as an expert resource during this process. Ruth, we are so thankful um, that you had the time and interest to work with us this spring on this fun project. Um, so maybe you can um, just tell us a bit about why storytelling is so compelling, especially in a professional and work context, um, and a bit about the process that got us here today. Sure, thank you for having me. And, and I've just had such fun working with these storytellers. So I'm excited to hear the, the stories that they've come up with. All right, I want you to think about a time when you saw a chart or maybe you saw a graph or heard a statistic that made your heart go a different direction? When was that? Never? Probably very rarely, if at all. Now, when was the last time you heard a story that made your heart go a different direction? Probably early today, I'm guessing. Stories have such power be to take us places, to help us meet people, to help us see things, that we may never have been able to do in real life. That's one of the powers of story. Um, and stories are really interesting because as human beings, our brains are wired for story. We look for story, we hear story, we make them up, we put in details when they're, they shouldn't be there. Um, and we tell stories, all of us tell stories. And so the, the skill of storytelling that you'll see in practice today is a skill that is trying to use our brains and what we do naturally to different effect, to get your hearts to move a little differently than they were before you heard the story to the ends that the storytellers have set out for themselves. So how did we get here? Um, this storytelling process has been pretty much in four steps. One was a couple of weeks ago, I did a workshop on how to design a story. And each of these uh, storytellers joined that workshop either in person or um, as, a, as a video. Then they were invited to submit a one minute video of themselves telling what they wanted to tell about. Not the story, but just telling them what to tell about. So I looked at that, other people at the presidential precinct looked at that, and we decided that these three women were going to be our powerful storytellers. The third step 
was that over the past 10 days or so, I've worked with these storytellers. They're new storytellers. They weren't quite sure what to do. And we worked with, I worked with them to develop their idea into a story that is going to pluck your heartstrings, that is going to move you in ways that data and statistics and graphs will never do. So I worked with each of them, and this is step four. Here we are all together, step four, to hear them for the first time tell these stories in a public setting. Now they're not complete stories and polished, but they're here for you. These are stories hold, told from their hearts. These are stories told to your hearts. These are stories that have been worked on and um, very hard by these, by these storytellers. And these are stories that are um, going to have you ask different questions because they're gonna take you to places, have you see different things, help you meet different people and have your heart go in a different direction. So good luck storytellers. Great, thank you so much, Ruth, for those um, opening remarks. And we're excited uh, even more than ever before to get into our stories. So let me just briefly go over the format of our event. Um, I will briefly introduce each storyteller and then she will tell her story. And we will save a few minutes at the end of each story for some questions and answers with our storytellers. So uh, listen intently and come up with some good questions for our storytellers. It's really a great chance to learn from them. And feel free to ask questions about the content of the story or the process that got them there. I think we can learn from both content and process. Uh, and just a reminder that we are recording today. So our storytellers will have a, a good uh, capture of their story um, that, they can, uh, that they can use going forward. Um, and Hannah, just put a note in the chat. Uh, if you do have um, uh, questions for our storytellers, please pop it into the chat. Uh, and then I can, can read out the questions for our storytellers. So, so get the wheels turning and, and start thinking about good questions. And just a word uh, to our storytellers. Um, so we have not heard your stories yet. And it could be that some of you have crafted your story for a specific audience. You know, maybe it's for potential funders or maybe it's for your peer organizations or maybe it's for the community that you work with. If you would like those of us, our, the listeners, um, to put ourselves in the shoes of any specific audience as we're listening, just let us know if you think that's, that's helpful to us. Um, otherwise, we'll just keep our ears open and, and enjoy what you have to say. So now I am delighted to introduce our first storyteller, uh, Denai Tirawu from Zimbabwe. Denai is a lawyer and a women's rights activist who recently founded an organization that's working with adolescent girls to engage them in conversation and dialogue about social development issues using a gender lens. Uh, Denai, we cannot wait to hear from you. And those of us who are, are speakers today but are not um, telling a story right now, if we could all turn, uh, mute ourselves and turn our cameras off and we will give uh, the floor over to Denai. Over to you, Denai. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, no pressure from uh, Ruth's introduction. It's got everybody riled up about the stories that we're about to tell. Um, so as Nancy said, I'm a human rights lawyer from Zimbabwe and I founded this project called Enlightened Girls Education. So when Ruth and I were just practicing Everything was going so great. And then in the end, things went south. And it just showed me how difficult or challenging it is to tell a story on behalf of a diverse group of people and say it meaningfully in a way that does not discredit them or in a way that does not limit who they are as people. Um, so I grew up in a pretty average household. Um, I grew up in a community that was very communal in that even our houses were joined on the left. And there were days when you could actually hear what was happening in the next house. So for that day, if they're cooking a very delicious meal, you could actually smell it from your house and you would be comparing with whatever is being made in your kitchen, right? So that community was very close-knit and intertwined. 
and everybody would know what was happening in each other's lives. Um, our house was a four-roomed house and um, each house was fenced and um, there were these metal iron gates and these were the demarcations that we had between these houses. Um, the more well-off neighbors would have a precast wall around their house so you couldn't really see what was going inside, going on inside, but basically we just knew what was going on everywhere around us. I remember that our, our neighbor on the left built this very big house, which probably had eight or nine rooms, and they were housing about six or seven families, and these were all tenants. I remember vividly as a child hearing these very loud thud noises um, of something or someone being thrown against the wall, and it was so violent and you could really, really hear someone screams and wails. But with time, I stopped even waking up in the middle of the night every time that happened. So I later on discovered that the young woman who lived in one of these homes was married to someone who was in the army. And every time he returned from the barracks, he would beat her up. And I wondered if that had anything to do with love or relationships because it became such a constant thing that we just grew up with. Right next to us on our right was this woman. She was this lovely nurse. She was so beautiful by any shallow standards. And um, she used to wear a lot of makeup. It was not uncommon for me to see her husband dragging her across the yard. It was not uncommon to hear her screams and wails. It was not uncommon to see her eye covered in make um, covered by makeup just to cover up whatever would have happened to her the night before. I remember one day coming from school and just being told that she had died and I didn't even know what had happened. It had something to do with um, internal bleeding and complications. And as I grew older, I wondered if this was a consequence of all the violence, the unreported violence that she suffered at the hands of her husband and never reported. Um, I think about our church and going to Sunday school. And I remember very vividly this one session when the Sunday school teacher told two girls to come up front. So these two girls were twins and one was light skinned and the other was dark skinned. And they were both the same height and built. They were very athletic. They were bubbly girls, both of them very, very outspoken. And the Sunday school teacher asked us to choose who was more beautiful between the two and everybody pointed at the light-skinned girl because you know light is bright and everything like that and I remember feeling this sense of guilt when I got to school the next day which was a Monday and I went up to the darker twin and even apologized to her and now as I grew older and in hindsight I wonder what that information did to her and how it affected her on a personal level. I remember um, even at school having all these friends and in particular I had this one friend who had lost her mom at birth and she was so close to her dad they used to do everything together he was like um, she was basically the apple of his eye and she had these very very bright white eyes and she had the whitest teeth and they used to just shine especially in the dark against her dark skin she was so beautiful and she was so smart she used to do so well she used to have some of the best grades in our form and she was even very good at sport uh when we turned 11 she just stopped coming to school 
and we were told that she had been married off to a prophet from her church. Now she loved her church. She used to talk about it all the time because of all the things that they used to do as kids. And she used to talk about how when she was now ready, she would be married. And she used to be so excited, you know. And then I think about myself. I think about how inquisitive I was, how I was surrounded by all these different women and how unlike so many of them, I managed to get out. I managed to be surrounded by this band of sisterhood, of feminists, of women who showed me that there was more to me than what society around me was presenting to me because all the women around me, regardless of what they had done, regardless of their accolades, regardless of whatever position they were at in life, all they culminated to was wife. And I was lucky enough to get out of that environment and not be stuck with that narrative. And I know that marriage can be a beautiful thing, but for so many of us, especially in the background, for so many of us, marriage was the ultimate and is the ultimate option. So whatever you become, as long as you're a wife first, you're okay. So that prompted me to think about my project in Lighting Girls Education, because what separates me and all these girls, it is not just a fence. It's not just a black iron gate. It's access to information. It's access to opportunity. It's so many things that these girls do not have, even if they're school going, even if they're working women. So in Enlightened Girls Education is looking to bridge the gap of access. And the thing about it is that everything that happens to us in society, especially as women, is not by default, it's by design. And so when I look at Enlightened Girls Education, it's designed to disrupt the systems that limit what girls and women can and should be in society. Um, I think that the best way that we can tackle this is by being deliberate. Um, the best way to be deliberate is to offer mentorship to all these girls. Had I not had the opportunity to meet all these women who guided me and showed me a different context and narrative about who I could become and what I could do and what I could achieve, I would have never have been able to transition into the woman that I have become. So I think that um, there should be an opportunity for girls, regardless of their background, to also have access to information that can lead them to something new. It can be from somebody who's in tech. It can be from somebody who's an artist. All of these different narratives do not exist for a lot of these girls. And when they do see an independent woman or a woman doing something, it's usually from a negative context. Perhaps she cannot find a husband. Perhaps she is unmarried and is unattractive. Perhaps her husband died or she's a divorcee. It's always something linked to marriage and men and it limits just how far we can go. If we are to actually tackle these issues more deliberately from a social perspective and an economic perspective, we need to actually be very direct in the way that we intervene. As mentors, you get an opportunity to walk through this life thing with a young woman whose narrative right now is that at the end of the day, she is designed to be someone's wife, regardless of who she is, what she likes, what she wants to become. So I would like to invite different feminists from Zimbabwe to take up this opportunity to help a young girl out there, a young girl from my community who does not know that out there, there is so much potential waiting for her. There's so many different opportunities that she can harness and end up like me and end up like you and just participate in a more meaningful way that does not limit what 
a girl and a woman can be. That's it. Good. Thank you so much, Tanai. This is our, uh, I see Ruth doing our online clapping. So let's all give, uh, give Tanai uh, some, some virtual applause. Um, I wanted to just echo something that I see one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Vimbai, put in the, uh, in the chat. She said it really takes, takes us back to her childhood. And I wanted to just say, even though I did not grow up in Zem, um, all those rich details uh, about the house and the walls and the sounds, they really made us feel like we were right, right there with you. So um, very vivid. Um, great. Uh, questions for our first storyteller. Um, does anybody have anything they would like to, to ask Denai about her, her story content or her story process? This is Ruth. Denai, I thought that was beautiful. Well done. Um, and you, you've come a long way in that process of telling stories. I liked that, that you really set up a difference between you and these other girls and one of, and women. And one of that different, the difference was that black gate. And so you could yeah. show what was happening on one side and what was happening on the other. Next time you tell it, and I'm gonna do this for everybody. Next time you tell it, I wanna know a little bit about what was happening in your side of the gate. Um, okay. We heard, we heard what was happening on the other side, but we didn't hear what necessarily what was happening on your side of the gate. So I want to, to see a little bit more of some of that difference and those women who were mentors to you, who are eager that you want to emulate and give that experience to other, other girls. It was really well done. I loved the repetition. There was a good deal of repetition in it in words and images, and that helps us as listeners a great deal. So well done. Good job. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, I was really thinking about your notes about not making it very technical. <laughs> and I guess what was happening on the other side of the, the fence was me people watching extremely and not minding my own business. That's what, <laughs> that's what was happening. <laughs> Great. And I believe we have a question in the chat um, from Lawrence Lopez. Thanks, Lawrence, for your question. Uh, Denai, how did you feel protected by your community in these situations of violence? Again, kind of speaks to Ruth's question about what was happening in your life when you were um, hearing and seeing and absorbing these things. Um, I was raised by women. So we do not have any men coming into our house or if they did, they were not allowed to walk past the gate. So I rarely interacted with them. So most of the time I'll just listen and hear what was going on, but I do not experience it personally. Great, let me just see if we have any questions popped into the Q and A. Uh, we do. Um, Vimbai has a question about um, how you put all your thoughts to paper um, to really to really focus on it and, and take it seriously and find time. Vimbai says, um, uh, is also a part-time writer, but is kind of scribbling around on different books and ideas get lost through the years. How do you, how did you discipline yourself to put this together? Um writing and rewriting, listening to myself, recording myself um, as, I, as I change the story to keep with the time and also to see if the story had a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, I think that you should just keep writing until you get a draft that you are proud of and try and finish those unfinished stories and just take a chance on yourself and release one. Sometimes it helps to have other people holding you accountable. So if you tell people, I'm going to drop a story on my Facebook every Monday, it might help you to actually push and say every Monday I'm writing a story. It's just like finding ways to push yourself to do something. Uh, you can have, I, I think account accountability partners really, really help having people who you can tell and who can remind you that you said you wanted to do this and that. What, where, how far is your draft? How far have you gone with it? Yeah, I think that's a good way to do it. 
Great, great advice, thanks. And before we move on to our second storyteller, we did have one uh, very specific question from Nintendo wanting to know how to sign up to be a mentor with your organization. <laughs> okay, to sign up, you go on our Facebook page and you inbox us, but we're going to put a whole thing that really explains to people how they can sign up to be mentors, and you can just use that link, but we haven't posted it yet, but we will. Awesome. Thank mm. you so much, Denai. We loved hearing from you. Thank Great. you. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so now we are going to go on to our second storyteller, and I'm delighted to introduce everyone to Wura Lua Ayodele. Wura is from Nigeria, where she runs an organization that provides a shelter and a wide range of other direct services, critical services, for female survivors of gender-based violence to help them reclaim their lives. And Wura is also a lawyer and a, and a strong advocate and activist. Uh, so Wura, we're delighted to have you with us and I'll uh, turn the mic over to you and we will mute our, uh, ourselves and our video. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy. Today is really special for me because it takes me right back to the happenings of the last year. And it makes me remember vividly how I'm still mourning. I'm still mourning the death of Mary. Mary was a 28 year old Nigerian woman who was raped and killed in November of 2020. She was raped somewhere along the road while she was traveling. And when I was called, I rushed down to the hospital where she was taken to. I was hoping and praying on my way there that I would be able to save her. I would be able to do something. But then I lost her. She died and she became a victim, another victim of the pandemic last year. But then I remember Faith. Faith is for me better than Mary because Faith, as a 23 year old Nigerian woman was raped by armed robbers in her own home in April of 2020. Um, she was raped and left for dead. And for Faith, I feel she was better because I was able to rescue her. I can still remember very vividly the look on Faith's face, the shock, the pain and everything. As I lifted her onto my back, I had to carry her on my back and, take, and I took her to the hospital and from the hospital to the police station to make a report. And for several nights after that, I had to stay awake with Faith because she would always scream at night. Every time it got to that time of the night when she was raped, she would always remember and wake up and scream also the night till morning. She was with me in my women's shelter and I had to stay with her all through that time. I'm happy today because through my help, Faith um, has been able to get a job in a grocery store and she's in a better place. She goes to work. She looks so much beautiful, more beautiful than she even looked before. And I'm always so excited. She's out of the women's shelter. She has her own apartment. She's doing well. She's doing as well as Ify is doing. Ify is a 30 year old woman in Nigeria. She's five feet tall. She's light-skinned, really beautiful. Ify was married or forced into marriage actually by her parents at the age of 16 to a man who was twice her age, a man who had promised her that he was going to sponsor her through school. And for 14 years, Ify lived with this man, her husband, 
going through physical and sexual abuse. Of course, before long, she discovered that she was never going to go to school because her husband refused to keep up with his own end of the bargain. And she decided that she wanted to pursue her next passion, fashion design. For her at that time, going to fashion school was everything, everything she needed to be successful. But her husband did not think the same way. For him, he felt a wife's place is in the kitchen and her only usefulness was to take care of the children, his children. And so he ordered her not to go to fashion school. But against her husband's wishes and orders, if he enrolled in a fashion school, and for nine months, she went through a terrible time at home. Her husband would lock her up in a room. Sometimes he would lock her out of the house. And at other times he would beat her up so terribly that she would end up in the hospital. But if he was determined, she was so determined to finish fashion school so much that even from a hospital bed, she would connect virtually to this fashion school. Then came the year of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, the year 2020, the year of the lockdown in Nigeria, and of course, all over the world. But this was the year when Ifi and her husband were forced to stay together, live together in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the night. And as you can imagine, the abuse became really bad. But now he wasn't just beating her, he was doing so many other strange things. He would burn her body with a hot electric iron. And then he would, he would beat her up with a stick. And worst of all is, or was now that he would lock her up um, um, outside, lock her outside, um, chain her to a tree and leave her there all night in the cold. If his friends, and now I mean the few friends that were left, the ones who had not been driven away by her husband, advised her to leave the house. But then she had nowhere to go. There was a lockdown. But aside even having the lockdown, for if she wanted to be the good Nigerian wife, the wife who would endure, who would obey the culture and religion that constantly says, oh, wives should stay at home, wives should pray and fast and hope that someday their husbands will change. And for if she continue to hope that a better day will come. A better day never did come for Ifi, not with her husband. And in November of 2020, Ifi's husband beat her up so severely that she fainted and she had to be rushed to the hospital by her neighbors who had been alerted by her children. And I think, I remember the same November, 2020, the same month that Mary was raped and killed. I met Ifi at this time and I encouraged her to leave that abusive relationship, that abusive environment. And right there and then on her hospital bed, Ifi decided she made up her mind that she had had enough, that she deserved a better life. And so with my help, if he was able to lease a new apartment in another town, for her, she saw no other way than to leave the town where her husband lived. And for me, it was fine. She leaves the three, um, an apartment that has three bedrooms and she moved in there with her three children, beautiful children, a 10 year old boy, an eight year old girl and a six year old girl. Since then, Ify has struggled with health, with, um, health challenges. 
she has a health condition that, that has arisen from all the years of abuse that she has suffered from her husband. Every month I've had to give Ify food packages, money, medical supplies, and of course, most recently, I've had to give her free legal services to ensure that I got her husband to pay some money for child support. It's really meager. It's just a little under $100. It supports Ify and her children. She doesn't have a job yet, but she sleeps in her own bed. Her husband has threatened her so many times to take the children away, but she has not been threatened. She knows that she's in a better place now. And for me, that is victory. If he is one of the 220 women that I have rescued and come in contact with since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March, 2020, up till now, May, 2021. And I know there's so many women out there, so many women facing violence, women survivors of violence, who are hoping and praying that someone someday would see them, would reach them, would rescue them, would help them come out of the pandemic, the global pandemic, the pandemic of gender-based violence, the pandemic within the pandemic. And so one key lesson I have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic from the beginning up to now is the fact that deciding to lend my voice to support women like this, to support women survivors of violence, creating safe spaces for them has never ever been a mistake. And I am grateful for the decision to dedicate my life to ensure that I provide safety for them. Well, right now in Nigeria, I believe this is the least I can do, the least contribution I can make to social change. And I'm believing that everyone has one person or the other who has gone through violence. And it's time we all lend our voices to create the world that we want to see. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Wara, for sharing with us. Um, I saw a spark in there, even though those are hard stories to hear and powerful stories to hear. Uh, I saw a spark in, in Ify in, in her resilience and her, her will to, to have a, a different life um, for herself and for her children. So very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we do have a question already in the Q&A. Uh, and the question for you is uh, how you take breaks for yourself while supporting these women, especially during what you so aptly described as a, as a dual pandemic, you know, not just the public health crisis, but the ongoing crisis of violence against women. Okay, I, I, I believe I heard how I take time for myself. Um, I try to create time. In December, I was, I was emotionally drained. By December, I was emotionally drained. I was so drained, I was forgetting everything. You could tell me your name right now and I would forget the very next minute. And I was always crying. I was, I was, I was, I was, I knew I needed some time off. And so I took um, about two weeks off. I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't pick my calls. I didn't, I didn't do anything. Right after the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence globally, I went off until the new year. And for me, I recognize the fact that it is important to take time off um, for self-care. From time to time, I do that. Such a, an important practice. I see Ruth has unmuted herself. Ruth, do you have a question or comments for Wura? I have a comment for Wura. I feel like I would know if, he, if I saw her on the street. Um, she, she just came alive to me. And um, that, that, is, that is real, real powerful storytelling. The other thing I want to, to say is that your emotions in telling the story were so powerful 
and they brought up my emotions and compounded them and they grew to each other. And my heart is just full and sad for these women right now. And also so proud of you for what you do. Um, and so that's, that's the power of storytelling. Well done. Well done. Thank you. And before we move on to our third storyteller, I do um, also have a question for you, Wara. Um, what was the most challenging part for you about crafting this story? What did you find from a process perspective to be the, the toughest part? Okay, I think the most difficult part was having to remember all those little details. Um, for me, when I do the things, I don't stop to think about how the person looked or, um, how the person smelled or I, I, I don't stop to think about those things but crafting the story I had to sit down and then allow myself to remember and I remembered I started to remember all those little details and I discovered something new about myself while I was doing this and I actually block out memories um, for my own self-care I didn't even know I, I, I was doing that before um, I think when something really bad happens I just block it out so that um, I'm able to continue you know with the next person because it, it's never ending we go from one person to another person every single time and so um that was the most difficult part for me yes it was and i'm so grateful to ruth thank you so much i i had a conversation i my story was going to go completely differently <laughs> because i was avoiding remembering all those little details and she encouraged me to do that so thank you Thank you so much, Wara. We're going to move on to Sunny, but I see there's another question for you um, in the Q&A. If you are able to answer that question, um, either in the chat box, Wara, or in the Q&A itself, that would be great. Um, I'll let you handle that question and we'll go on to, to Sunny. And then if we've got a little time at the end, we can come back for some more questions. But it's a question for you specifically about what brought you to your work against gender-based violence. But I'll let you handle that via, via text. So. Great, thank you so much. So last but certainly not least, we have Sunny Lawrence with us today as our third storyteller. Uh, Sunny is working in the area of positive youth development in Liberia, and she has a passion for promoting education and literacy in her country, especially among young people. And a uh, fun fact, Sunny also uh, has her own radio show. Uh, so Sunny, we're so excited to have you with us today. Um, and I will uh, pass you the mic. If you could turn on your video, I'll hand it over to you. I'm Sonny Christine Lawrence, uh, Founder, Executive Director of Agents of Positive Change. My story began on a refugee camp. My parents have to travel to like Côte d'Ivoire due to the war in Liberia that destroyed almost everything. I remember being born in a tiny little camp and having to wait in line for hours to get some meal um, that was being served to the refugees there at the camp. Um, after field time um, at the camp, the war in Liberia ended and my parents moved back. Back home in Liberia, I remember starting school at age five and I had my older brother who started with me. He was nine years old at then and it was our first time to actually be in school. Everything was new to us and there was so much destruction because of the war. So um, the school we attended actually really never had any um, space, uh, especially when it comes to a reading space. We also had some 15 year olds who were just starting school at that time. Some were learning how to read their ABCs and one, two, three, four, the very first time. And for me and my brother, it was actually a challenge because we, we totally had no idea. Growing up 
in my preteen, I faced reading as a challenge. It's twice from the, the, the second grade back, back to Kilong Garden again because I, I wasn't really reading as per my level. Um, later on, my family moved to Freetown, Sierra Leone, where I started at another school uh, where I met a lot of children who read very well and who actually uh, compared me to see the need that there is more that I can do than I have ever thought. So at the school, I met Dina. Dina was a bright, tall girl uh, with a really long, dark hair. She loved books. Dina was with books every other day. Um, during break time, she was always there with a book. Um, during lunchtime and even after school, Dina was always reading. And I was really stunned by seeing her actively engaging in books. So I reached out to Dina and made her, made her my friend. Um, Dina actually helped me to read and to pronounce difficult words that I barely could not understand. I remember my first novel I read with Dina was um, the Harry Potter novel. Um, she helped me to pronounce the words that I could not pronounce very well. And we uh, searched in, in the dictionary for words definition, especially of words that we could not really understand. Um, Dina actually inspired me uh, to love books. Um, she was uh, just this perfect friend I needed at that particular time. And she was so dedicated uh, to our time together. Um, and every day, every day, I look forward to meeting her and actually reading with her. Also at home, my dad, a social worker, had his um, home library. And he was uh, interested in detective novels. So whenever he's about to read, he will sometime call me in his uh, library and we'll read together. Um, he actually explained few sentences to me in the books that he was reading um, to create this plea it is that the writer was trying to say. Sometimes I would just read, but with no understanding. My dad helped to create that image in my mind. So whenever I'm reading a novel, I'm looking forward to seeing the images, the pictures, and those detailed information that the books provide. And right now, because of that, I prefer books rather than movies. I, I realize that um, books give more detailed information. They describe everything. A movie is just flashlights, and sometimes you will not understand. I barely sometimes won't understand as compared to actually reading a book. My dad actually inspired me um, to be someone to love books um, by making time for me over the weekends um, and helping me to understand words, um, defining words and creating the images of words in my mind. Also, um, growing up as well, I also had this um, mentor, uh, that's my mom. She, she also always, and up to now, she always tells me that a book is like a ship that takes you to a far away land. It's like you've never been to wherever you are reading before, but as you read, it's like you are already there. So those clear, those information actually um, created the desire for books in me. Um, my dad also, whenever he traveled, 
sometimes when he's coming, I'm looking forward to something really nice, perhaps a nice shoe or some new clothes or something, but he brings a book. At first, I really didn't like the idea, but after our time together, I actually realized what he was trying to um, make me understand that there is so much knowledge, so much ideas that you can actually learn from a book than from anything else, which I cherish up to this moment. Today, I see library as a space where one can leave the noisy world and just reflect on what is it that you want to be, what you want to do, how you can do it. And basically it's, it's a wealth of knowledge because there are so many books from different writers, different perspectives on different topics. So it's like enriching your vocabulary and creating innovative ideas that you can actually use to transform the world in whatever way that you want to. So for me, growing up, libraries were the only place you could find me. I was always, always knee deep in books. And today I am fighting or working to ensure that every child, every school, every village, in every place in Liberia um, that children should have access to quality education. And I believe the best way that they can do that is to have a space where they can read, a space where their peers can read with them and help them like Dina helped me in my school days, um, a space where kids can think and uh, innovatively, creatively, and to become the leaders um, that they want to be in the future. I see library as a space where you can create what isn't there. Um, because seriously, um, having quiet, to have a quiet space, especially in the African setting, you're at home and there is so much noise. No one really care. Even if you have homework, you want to study, really, uh, no one really care that they should be quiet for you to study. Um, but there's, there, there's just this kind of uh, uh, eruption or noise everywhere. But a library, there are rules, it's always quiet, it's always calm, it's always full of life, especially um, if you find it. Uh, my NGO, Agents of Positive Change, um, we are working um, to make sure that books are given to children, whatever way, so that they can find that peace, they can find out what it is that they want to be, that joy, of actually um, being to a place that they have never been before. Like my mother told me that a book is like a ship that takes you to another land. Uh, I actually, uh, throughout my program, I help kids to see that you don't necessarily have to be somewhere to know about that place. You can read about it and get all the information you need is all in the books. Today, I am passionate about helping children read. Today, I am passionate, like I struggled during my childhood days after the war, struggled to read, struggled to pronounce words. There are thousands of children, Liberian children, who are in similar situation that I was back then in my childhood days. So part of my passion is to create that safe space for them a space where they can learn, a space where they can think, a, a space where they can design and develop into the leaders that they want to be and the leaders that Africa actually need, the leaders that the world actually need, the leaders that can transform our world and make a world, make our world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny, for sharing your story with us. Um, it really makes me wish that every person on the planet could have a Dina in their life. Absolutely. So we have two questions that have come in for you. Um, one, uh, 
This person says, it sounds like reading became a bonding experience for you with Gina and with your family. Uh, do you still bond with people over books and over reading? Yes, yes, I still do that. Even up to now, my dad and I still read together. It's like, it's part of, it has been like a culture now in my family. I have a reading time and we, we do this um, often. It's, it creates that bonding. As we learn, we share different ideas. Um, and even up to now, my dad and I still read some of his detective uh, books and I, I give him some insight and he's really, really excited that I, I was able to follow up up to now. Yeah. That's awesome. I see we have another question and then I'm gonna hand the floor over to Ruth for just a few um, closing reflections, maybe about, about your story, Sunny, and also about the stories as a whole. Um, we have a question from uh, Busi Sakile, who says, I love reading. I have since I was in grade four, and I relate so much to the impact that books have and reading have on our lives. Uh, my question to you is, which type of books do you enjoy reading? And do you see yourself represented in the books that grace your local library? Yeah, so my first novel I ever Uh, and I read together. That was my first ever novel. Um, I actually love the story that J.K. Rowling actually um, I wrote. Um, it's is somehow magical, but it has so much reality in it. Right. So um, actually reading Harry Potter, I actually see I see myself as this wizard who's. <laughs> It was to fly with a broom or do some magical things. And I mean, it actually makes me to know that as a person, I, I can do whatever um, whatever I, I um, feel is right. And I should not limit myself, um, especially um, when it comes to what uh, brings me um, fulfillment and happiness. So I, I actually see myself as that, you know, not a wizard, but really, in that position as someone who can, you know, do whatever. Love it. Thanks so much, Sunny. Um, so we'll have just a few closing reflections from Ruth in the last minute or two that we have, and then I'll give um, one last word to all of our storytellers. But Ruth, over to you. Great, thanks. Sunny, that was, that was beautifully told. And um, the richness of the details that you gave about your your home life and your reading journey um, really, I think, took many of us as listeners on that journey with you. And we're so excited that, that, we, that you are now focused on this and we can see why. We can see why. And that's one of the, the powers of what you just did for us is to, to help us see why you're doing it and why we should join you, whether in practice or in theory, to, to join you in this, in this effort to help um, all children and every person be able to get away when they need to, to see places they haven't seen before. So thank you for, for that story. Well done. And I just wanted to say that even though Sunny was not on video, I want you to re reflect on how strong her story was for us. We didn't need to see her. The stories are about words. And what was fascinating is her story itself was about words. And it was almost even more powerful that words and words supported words. And we didn't need pictures. We could make it up in our own mind. So as you think about how stories are presented to you and how you present stories, think about how to make that experience for the listener even more powerful by layering different kinds of experiences onto each other. So for all three of you, and Denai, if you can put yourself on video just so we can see your beautiful face, I want you all to know that you have, you each of you gets a 10 over 10 today. Well done. <laughs> um, it's, it was, a, it was a, a, um, a journey. It's always a journey to come up with a story that's different than you tell around the dinner table or than you tell your friend somewhere um, along the along a, um, in the car or something. This kind of storytelling takes work. 
and each of you has put a lot of work into those stories. And I hope that you will reflect a little bit on what went well, what you might have changed different and, and do differently next time, because it is a learning process. These stories are always drafts. They will be different the next time you tell them. They will be different for the different audiences that you will tell them with. And we are so privileged as your listening audience this time to have been part of that storytelling making. Um, because I think you all will do terrific. So 10 over 10 from me and um, well done. Keep telling stories. Thank you. Great, thank you for those reflections, Ruth. Could not agree more. Um, before we close, uh, Danai, Wura, Sunny, any last words from you? Feel free to unmute and offer any last uh, few, few words of reflections or thoughts. Um, thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Ruth, so, so much. Um, this was something that I found very challenging because I'm already a public speaker, but I'm always speaking about things that people don't care about. You know, the, the, the policy things and all that stuff. So just having this platform really, really, really inspired and enlightened me. And I would really love to continue um, with uh, similar similar opportunities, just to continue to learn how to speak. It's, it sounds like it's something so easy until you have to do it, until it's now, you're not even with your friends and you're just chit-chatting. So I would really hope and I would love for us to continue having this because I know today was the first time. Next time it's gonna sound like a TED talk, you know, because of all the improvements. <laughs> so I would really, really, really appreciate us to continuing with this. And I would like to say thank you to the other two speakers. I would like to know more about your projects and we can always link outside of this platform. And thank you to everybody who came to watch. Thanks, Tanai. Uh, how about you, Wura, Sunny, any last word? Yes, um, thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you everyone for, for this. I would just want to say that I've learned that um, my little actions bring in the greatest results. And I learned that um, um, during this time, having to craft the story. And for me, I just want to leave this with everyone. Um, now is a time that is more important than ever to lend our voices. However it is, telling a story, writing, speaking, having a conversation with someone. Um, it's a time not to sit on the fence, to speak against injustice, against discrimination, against violence in all our private and public spaces. And to, of course, continue to create the kind of space and world that we want to see. I want to say thank you to Ruth for taking out the time to help me put this help my story together. Um, I learned storytelling from the Princeton at my time there, and I started a storytelling event. I just got um, a video today of all the stories of different women, you know, that we were able to put together. And I was telling myself, oh, I help other women share their stories, and then I, I'm always afraid to share mine. So thank you so much. Um, this was a really wonderful platform. I, I, I want to say thank you. And thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the other two speakers too. Um, I'll continue to connect with everyone. Thank you. Great. Over to you, right, Sunny. Uh, yeah, if you can hear me with my video on, I, should I turn it off? It's, uh... We can hear you. Okay, um, I would just like to say thanks to the presidential precinct family. Uh, thanks to you, Roots. Um, I actually never felt that um, I could tell a story. I've always been hearing stories, reading stories, but not telling myself. Um, I'm really happy that you worked you work me through this process. And also listening to Wura and uh, Dina, I am inspired by the work they are doing and I'm really, really, really inspired. Thank you, Nancy, and the entire presidential precinct family um, for giving us this opportunity to um, share our stories. Well, back at the three of you, we're so impressed and touched by what you've shared with us today. We hope that you, uh, Sunny, Denai, and Wura will be able to take these stories and continue to, to build them out and use them to enhance your work and to gain support. 
um, to continue your tremendous impact. And we're just so honored to be able to accompany you on your leadership journey. Um, so this brings us to the close of our event. I'd like to also thank all of our uh, colleagues, our alumni and precinct friends who could join us today. Ruth, thanks so much for being here too. Your interest and your support, all of you means the world to us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing all of you at a future event, whether in this virtual space or hopefully in person. Um, so in the meantime, uh, take good care, be well, uh, and uh, we will certainly see you next time.